Hey folks, I think we're back. I'm just going to go on uh, and check my audio to make sure that everything is good because I've had problems in the past. And there's a little delay here so I can't see myself yet. <clears throat> okay, we're good. Yay. All right, uh, so what did I do? I just did a video, um, I don't know how long it was, about 90 minutes, where I was uh, drawing the sketch that you can see on my screen. And this is for um, the adventure coming out, hopefully at the end of this month. Uh, it is to be titled, but it has uh, Fisher People and uh, Undead in it. And um, they have some kind of unholy pact, which allows the fishermen prosperity uh, and access to some places that only the dead would normally go, and maybe some pearls from the bottom of the ocean that the dead bring up. Um, and in exchange for that, of course, there are human sacrifices. So that's what we're that's what we're doing today, or now we're inking. So um, let's just make sure this is all saved. Make a new layer. Perfect, and let's change the opacity a bit so I can. So I can see what I'm doing. Okay, and let's fill this in. Properly. Okay, what size do I want to draw in? Small, medium, let's start with small. Um, I've tried to make these brushes roughly corresponding to my favorite Castell real markers, but of course the actual size in Photoshop depends quite a lot on on what resolution I'm drawing at, and uh, of course it's never quite the same twice in a row. So whatever. Okay, I'm just trying to decide where to start. Let's just start down here. And I kind of got to draw things uh, front to back, otherwise I'll run into overlap problems. Nice and smooth. Yeah. I'm uh, traumatized by my Windows Photoshop painting experience because I would often find the driver for my Wacom would uh, go kind of bananas, and what would happen is I'd get these weirdly angular lines. Just drawing that gives me a rash. I thought I saw that just now, but no. The Mac provides. All right, this is a, like a seawall kind of thing. Just to protect this house from the worst of the waves. <clears throat> the nice thing about some kinds of textures is that you just don't need to be that precise. I've messed up the perspective on that one, though. I feel like it goes quite high enough up in the back, but that's, I'm going to have to fix that. said this before but um, I, you know I'm a 
newbie inker, but I've uh, I really like this advice to you know use line thickness to kind of indicate the the uh, distance between things. And so if there's a big overlap, um, you have a thicker line. And <clears throat> so I tend to do all my little interior texturing details in uh, in, in this S brush, which is, corresponds to my Faber Castell small. And then I can uh, outline in the M. And then bigger shapes, I got an M plus, and then a, there's no such thing in real life, but there's a big fatty that I use sometimes, depending on the resolution I'm drawing in. Oops. So this will be a real test of viewer patience, I think, because a lot of the decision making has already been done. Um, you know, so this is going to be probably a little less chatting, maybe about what what all this stuff is and what's in it. We'll see, but uh, I find this part nice and relaxing because it kind of helps you takes the drawing from like a blue scribble to like the final thing, and that can be it's so fun to watch that. Does that look like a wall? <clears throat> I think it reads like a wall. And let's put a bit of beach here. Some sand. It begins. Hmm? Isn't that nice? I love that. Okay, I had a funky thing. I'm not sure how I will draw this yet, but let's let's have to give it a crack. So this is the chain winch to hoist up to stop boats getting in. This is pretty flipping huge, bigger than a human would ever turn on their own, maybe it's a multi-person, multi-person winch. You know what, it would probably be a horizontal winch, but I don't know. At this scale, I mean, it's going to be microscopic, right? So you just have to hope people can understand what it is. So then let's have a what do you have here. So like a little commemorative slab out here. This is what the chain's anchored to on the other end. So it's made of big fat blocks. In case somebody tries to ram it with a fully loaded trireme. God knows what. I guess the trireme would never fit through here, would it? And have some kind of metal plate here. Big ring, I guess, is what you would really have. <clears throat> Is that vertical enough? Maybe not.
And on this side, let's have a uh, some kind of tuning fork thing with the chain would pass through just to get it going in the right direction. Take some of the weight if it is struck. And let's see, can I manage to draw a chain that looks like a chain? Sort of. <laughs> and I was trying to think the angle this would come down at. Huge chain. Guess it would do the job, and where will it touch the water? Here, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I think I will label this chain so everybody can tell what it is. And there will be some disturbance in the water. Oops. Oh, my poor cat wants to come in, but he's going to want to cuddle. And he can't cuddle now. A little tiny marker for wood grain and shadows.
crazy. Short break, yeah, just uh, my uh, drawing and writing and planning time comes in like closely spaced little chunks and I gotta strike while the iron's hot, otherwise it'll be a week before I get to this again, so. All right, so the back of this island. Dungeon crumbs. I'll set up my uh, layer for doing white outlines. Just to have that ready. <clears throat> a bit weird with the blue still in the background, but when it's gone, I think it helps clarity a little bit. It's pretty subtle, but whatever. And now we need roof texture. You just went to my blog and saw the news about my Kickstarter. You can't wait. That is, that's good news for me. Yeah, so... I've been doing these adventures for about four years, and if you go to my blog, uh, you can pretty much download them all. They're all free, and um, uh, it isn't super convenient, though, and even if you just had a zip file, I know how that goes. You download them, and then they sit on the hard drive, and you never see them again. They're in your, one day I will read this, and um, it'd just be nice to have them all as a, as a book. Um, so, yeah, I've been... Uh, doing a couple things. One, I've been trying to increase the number of these that I do in any given month, and the reason for that is that uh, the Kickstarter compilation should have a certain kind of minimum size, otherwise it'll feel like a children's book. And I think um, the cutoff value is going to be 48. Um, 48 adventures, that's a nice <clears throat> round number. And uh, Roof, roof, good, okay. Um, yeah, so 48 Adventures, there's going to be a bunch of extra content um, in there as well as stretch goals and to just kind of tie it together a little bit. Um, but I've also been kind of grappling with uh, what is the printing format? And I, I tried doing kind of a compilation a while back and um, I ran into the problem that basically a lot of my early adventures were done in landscape format. Um, kind of wide and and short, and that was cool. Uh, and then I switched to portrait, um, I think because uh, that was pretty much the only way you can do um, like a drive-through RPG kind of thing. And uh, anyway, that, that languished because it's, it's just a pain in the butt to reformat all the adventures. Um, and I think maybe my heart wasn't really in the, the portrait format. Um, I think I've made about nine adventures in portrait. So then it uh, turns out drive-through uh, has actually added a portrait uh, eight and a half by 11 format. So I've, I've spent a whole bunch of time reformatting for that. I've got a test print on the way um, and I'm really hoping that, that turns out okay. If that doesn't work, what I'll probably do is um, get an actual print run. Um, made. Uh, problem with that is that just like my drawing time uh, is really curtailed. I don't have a lot of time to figure out fulfillment options. i got a kids and job and all that stuff. So uh, 
it's a level of stress that I'm trying to see if I can get away without. But if that's what I need to do, I will do that. So I've been working with some guest writers, and uh, I won't tease upcoming names. You'll just see them when they come out. But uh, Kyle Chenier uh, did one. He did Hounds of Low Tide, which was super cool. Um, and I got a bunch more coming out. And uh, that's actually been neat to just to see what other people do with the format, but that's actually made it easier for me to, to do kind of up the volume a bit. Oops, there's going to be seawall here. All right, let's get some wood texture here. These pilings. <clears throat> Looks like a boardwalk. All right, let's do some more seawall. For drawing the S first. But yeah, the, the printing option for the Kickstarter is the really the big decision that remains. Um, if you do drive through RPG, uh, as you probably know, uh, or you may know, what what the way that works is drive through has this fantastic uh, Kickstarter fulfillment option where you can basically just say, uh, I'd like to send complimentary or wholesale rather copies to the following email addresses. So your, the way you structure your Kickstarter is you basically just um, charge for the, the labor and, and fixed costs like editing and additional art and things like that, because I would like to get some additional art. Um, so, you know, the Kickstarter pledge amount might be really small. It might be eight bucks or 10 bucks or whatever it is. Um, and then what happens is when the campaign completes uh, and the book is ready, you just get an email from Drive-Thru RPG saying, hey, your book is ready, and just pay us wholesale price for the book, the printing cost. Um, I, you know, presumably there's some markup for them in there, but you pay that printing cost. And from my end, the fulfillment is super easy because all I have to do is just dump a whole bunch of email addresses from the Kickstarter um, into DriveThruGh, and uh, they will go and and send all the rest. So if the, you know they'll do returns, they'll do all the usual stuff that they do, um, which is cool. Make sure my two walls look <clears throat> kind of similar. Um, if you go with something like uh, like a print run, then the Kickstarter basically there's no way for me to have you know the, the backers pay for their own shipping options. All that has to be built into the Kickstarter price, as I understand. So in that case, the Kickstarter pledge amount would be wholesale plus the markup, editing art costs, all that kind of stuff, everything you would expect to pay at a bookstore for buying a book plus the shipping. So in that case, I don't know what the pledge amount would be, but it would be something more like $40. Uh, that's Canadian, maybe. Um, 
so one of the nice things about that is you get a bit more control over the quality of the book. Drive through does have some occasional quality assurance issues. Uh, you know, that's I guess you get that convenience versus quality trade off, um, and you don't have to fill your living room with books. And I certainly don't want to be hand stuffing envelopes because, given my hours in the day, it would take me six months to fulfill everybody's orders. And you'll be moved on to other things before you ever see your books, even if I had finished writing before I did the Kickstarter. Hey, that's look kind of cool, eh? Like a little seaside village. So let's do some black lines to um, get the depth. Right, so um, the problem is, you know, Print runs only make sense if you're going to do a certain number of them. And I honestly have no idea how I'm going to sell. I mean, I get a lot of high fives, and I'm grateful for everybody's support on Patreon, um, which has really been fantastic. I don't know what percentage of people are going to buy buy books, and maybe there's some non-Patreon uh, patrons who will buy books. Uh, I mean, that that's a thing that could happen. So I honestly don't know. Could it be 150 copies? Could it be 600 copies? I don't know, and because the dif this differing structure of the Kickstarter campaign, um, you know, I can't have people pledge eight dollars and then say, "Good news, we've made it," you know, to the print run stretch goal. Now um, I'll do a print run. I can't do that because I can't do that for eight dollars. So um, or whatever it is that the labor markup cost is. Um, so that's that's a bit of a trick. It feels like I have to kind of decide beforehand. One of the things I could do is use pod printing um, in the hopes that I'll make it to a print run, uh, but not use drive-through fulfillment. And so everybody just pays the full price plus shipping up front. I hopefully don't get screwed on um, shipping. You know, shipping prices changing, which a lot of Kickstarters have apparently run afoul of. Um, and then that would allow me to then ship, uh, sorry, switch printing options quite late in the campaign. So Carl asks, when am I going to do it? Um, I had thought maybe it could be May. I don't think it's going to be May. It's going to be more like August, um, something like that. But I used to make these elaborate Halloween costumes. You can actually see them on my on my channel and. Uh, there's a stage in making that costume where you've kind of solved a lot of the engineering problems, but and now it's down to like, okay, Halloween is like six days away. What do I actually have to do to make this thing work? Um, and that's when I actually sit down and crack down a real to-do list. I've really got to get this, you know, lots of little problems sometimes remain to be solved. Um, and I haven't got to that stage with this book yet. Obviously, most of the content is written. I've been um, laying it out in book format as I go because the margins are slightly different, so I have to edit it um, or refine the content. I don't know if this will read right. Probably not. I guess it sort of does. Let's make that a bit fatter. How am I erasing? Thankfully, I've been getting some good advice from people, so, uh, I mean, too many to mention, really, but uh, I want to especially thank Rachel Kahn, who, uh, she's a Canadian artist, uh, lives around here, and she's um, she did the, those amazing Bicrom books, which is, uh, what if, you know, Crom was like your spirit advisor and is hanging out with you? 
and helping you deal with the, the pressures of everyday life. Sorry, of Conan uh, was, and it's just, it's really beautiful. Anyway, she's she's gone through that whole process a couple times, so she's been giving me some tips. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you do it as long as it's fun, and then uh, there comes a point where it it's not that fun because <laughs> it's like a ridiculous project. These Halloween costumes, but uh, yeah, I did um, I did a narwhal this year, and I I well, didn't do quite so much uh, video of that, but my younger rascal really wanted one, and uh, the, my elder Killet. He's he's benefited more than uh, the younger. I don't know what a ballista looks like in the back. I guess it looks like what I want it to look like. Yeah, so I, I did a narwhal, and I think that was kind of the last gasp for a while. One day I might do a big spider again. I want this to read nice and clear so you can tell what it is. So maybe that means giving it only one leg instead of three. That way the silhouette is a little simpler. <clears throat> Carl says, I might want to have some pipes out of the wall to get water to flow off the land area and away from the buildings. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. I think I have to make them a decent size so they read like pipes. Yep, Irvin, it's fun how it's coming to life. Let's zoom out, have a look again. Every, it's at this point in my drawing that I often want to, th like, what is my square inches per hour? Because <laughs> uh, how long is this going to take me? And I have occasionally had that feeling of, like, oh, my God, am I really going to do flipping brick texture on literally all this? But then I just have to remind myself, actually, I like drawing bricks. All right, time for a white outline. And I guess there'd probably be some thing like this, wouldn't there? Some little, maybe even, oops. Something like that. Let's have it stick out a bit. Lash it with a little X. Chuck some wood grain on there. Guess I better finish the stand. That that's the thing that can happen is you can like get you can move on and forget. Oh shit, I gotta come back and I don't know what this is made of. 
the stand might be stones. Otherwise, you're going to be standing in mud moving around with this thing, aren't you? Oh, don't like that. Black splodge. <clears throat> All right, what do we got if we don't look at the sketch? That's what we got. We have a seawall and a watchtower. I haven't thought much about land texture. I'll have to get to that. And I can see I missed you know, these little things here. Yeah, I think you're right, Carl. You've been there feeling like overwhelmed by the amount of scribbling you got to do to make this thing finished, but it does it does pay off. That kind of want to avoid a tangent here, so some sand, sand on it. And I've got to come back and do uh, ripples around all the water to make it read clearly as water. This feels like it would be a bit shadowy. Let's put some cobblestones here. I think that's sort of clear, clear enough. And I said there was going to be a flag, didn't I? Fat tracer here. Let's just do the line in the tracer. I think there's a degree to which I'm not really trying to draw it realistically, but it's like when you paint miniatures, they're not really meant. In most cases, you're not going to really get down on the table and look at it. You're trying to make something that looks good when viewed from, you know, an arm's length away. So it, you get this kind of exaggerated, uh, exaggerated shading on the miniature. Oops can't draw. And that's kind of what these fat outlines do. They're like not realistic exactly, but they just help call out physical objects. So they can look maybe a little bit like icons of themselves. That's okay. Did I finish the dungeon I was working on previously? I did not. Um, I was actually just looking at that a while ago. I've had to take a bit of time off uh, drawing anything for the last few weeks. It's been busy. Um, but I probably will come back to that. So one of the, I guess one piece of cool news is that the one page dungeon contest for 2018 is now accepting entries. So that's actually how I got started in all of this. Um, you know, I, I did this back, that contest back in 2012, and it was a lot of fun, and uh, we produced something that, that nobody noticed, really, um, but it was just so much fun. <clears throat> and later started playing uh, Torchbearer, which was a dungeon crawly game that just needed me to start making dungeons again, and that kind of got me, That was those are the two pushes that really got me going. So, uh, I think, long story short, 
I think I may use that dungeon. Um, that's a, it's right here, actually. May, I may use this for the one-page dungeon contest. We'll see. We'll see. Wood grain. So what have we got? Anybody worked out my square inches per hour? <laughs> I've been doing this for 40 minutes. So if I've done maybe half of this lower bit of the island, um, so maybe that is another equal area to everything I've done so far, maybe. So I got one. Two, three, four, five, let's call it six, seven. So I've done an eight in 40 minutes. So that's 16 over three hours. So a few more hours to go before this is anywhere near done. Can you vote? No, you don't vote. Uh, the way the one-page dungeon contest works is um, what you should do. I say should in the special sense where I don't tell you anything. Um, but it's fun to just do one uh, if you have the time. Uh, but no, they have judges. Oops, I'm in red. Um, and actually, I think they're succeeding in... So the dungeon one-page dungeon contest has actually changed hands a few times over the years. Um, it's been run by a bunch of different people. Um, and uh, they're actually, I think, getting some of the original cast and crew back together. Uh, hope That was the goal to kind of do that for next year, but I think actually some of them have stepped forward to do it uh, this year, which is really kind of fun. And as part of uh, talking about that, they actually revealed, or they you know, re reposted what was the first one-page dungeon basically ever, which I think is just really cool. And I owe a lot to, to that. Um, a few years ago, I... I banged out a couple of maps for people to use because some people get stuck on the art because um, there's some like freakishly good art that people are doing in these things like um, uh, I think Luca I'm going to say his last name wrong but you'll you can just go look at previous winners he does amazing art and uh, he I think he took it last year last few years actually they've been they've been a little shy about declaring a unilateral winner um, which is their prerogative. It's kind of nice, but you know, I guess once you get up to very high quality and you've got no typos and everything reads clearly and the concept is cool, it can be very hard to pick pick the actual winner winner. Um, so they've been giving up prizes to to multiple people. These shingles are lame. Look at the lame, tired shingles. What's the site? Um, just look up, literally just type in one page Dungeon Contest 2018. I forget now. I think it's called dungeoncontest.com or org or, or something, but, but it's, it's easy enough to find. Um, it, in previous years, it was kind of mostly run on a forum, and in the last few, it's been run... Um, uh, there's like a website for it, so um, it's made it a little harder to to kind of talk about it. But there's a there's a Google Plus forum 
Google Plus community called the One Page Dungeon Contest. So that's also just about as easy to find. Um, but the guy running it, um, he just goes by Dungeon Contest on uh, Google Plus. Uh, what's he done is uh, he's put together a guide, just you know, putting together some tips and tricks and some clear rules like you know f maximum file size and stuff like that. Let's put something over the door. imply some brickwork here. When I talk about this a lot in my individual uh, drawings is that it's really important to never kind of screw with the perspective of your texturing. It's like just every line on the texture should try and reinforce the 3D aspect of it. It's easy to not get that right. Um, Don't need to draw every brick. I don't know if you can see me do this or if it even makes any any difference, but if I have a vertical line on a house, and this is the ground here, and there's some grass or whatever, um, and I'm outlining super thick, I will come down most of the way, but when you get down to the bottom, the dif distance between the house and then the grass in the background is, is smaller down at the bottom, so I'll tend to taper that line a little bit um, and come in like this. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of the time you probably just can't tell. Some drugs are kicking in, I guess. Can't get that part straight. And let's thicken up around the roof because there's kind of an overhang there that should be a bit fatter. All right. That's good. And let's put some white around that wall. Oops. I don't know if this will muck everything up. Filling in brick texture down here. But... Okay. And let's. Oh, I was going to do white here. Sometimes I find these white outlines kind of jazz the eye a little bit, like there's a bit of a, make sure I go fuzzy with the contrast, and it doesn't look quite right, and I never know, I feel ambivalent about them, but I think it does help sometimes. Let's do some more wall. So here, art fans, you've got a tangent, so I've got two things at different depths, that are meeting at a point, 
and that tends to produce the illusion of uh, flatness and gets rid of any depth. And so I would make the decision to um, move that house actually a little bit. Let's see if I can find it. Um, to increase the overlap. My uh, other adventure I'm doing for the end of this month is with guest writer Stephanie Bryant, and she has she's done some really cool things. She's uh, I'm including the Threadbare RPG where you play puppets. Uh, I haven't we haven't got that to our table yet, but. Uh, the map for the adventure she's written is uh, also going to need some buildings, so I'm going to be in a building, building happy mood this month. It seems. Whoa. Doing a little bit less texturing on this roof because I want the watchtower to stand out in front of it and get a bit heavier up here at the front edge. But and I'm going to go around the watchtower with a nice thick, oops, thick white line. Time for my annual save my work. Okay, this is just noodling on house details. Um, let's put a little window up at the top of this one. Maybe they've got a bigger Bigger window than some of the others. I don't know what that is. That's just some greebles. House greebles. 
You know what? None of these have chimneys. If there was ever an island that would need chimneys uh, to keep warm, it's probably this. But on the other hand, uh, maybe they don't have anything to burn. I don't know. How would an island like this heat itself? Just vats of disgusting fish oil. Let's finish this wall. <clears throat> Don't have enough dungeon crumbs around these houses. Well, I get to the ground. We'll do that as a last pass. Okay, this will be fairly simple. Let's get that S marker. Okay, I'm gonna do the white outlines here to return that to legibility. So tiny. All right, next house. Let's do the one offshore. And why don't we give them, let's give them a chimney for a change. And to make the point, let's put it on the near side. I, when you hold down shift in Photoshop, it constrains you to to uh, straight lines. I would love to have something that would constrain it to isometric isometric angles as well. Maybe the shrines produce heat. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. And let's put little, I don't know what the pots would look like on this one. I think to make this look right, the pilings would be visible in the uh, in the kind of the construction. They wouldn't just stick out the bottom, but you'd see them up here, kind of thing.
once again, nice thick line underneath. I once, uh, one of my older uh, isometric dungeon tutorials involves a bridge. I'm painting a bridge or drawing a bridge, and uh, I put this music from Incompetech on it, which is funny because that's actually where I got the, used to get graph paper from. And uh, anyway, when I draw now, that image, that music still comes into my brain. I burned it in like an old arcade game with Pac Man on it. It's looking okay. I'm do the usual piling business. Okay, let's have the ramp. boards nailed to it to the non-slip boards and the far piling all right so let's bring in the black outlining down here Okay, bricks. Probably this wouldn't be a stone house, right? On uh, on pilings, I think. I used to paint, uh, Jamie. Um, so for then I would definitely add color, uh, but for these I, I tend not to. If you want color, um, you should look at the work of Guillaume Tavernier, and uh, he's a I think he's French. Excuse me, he's in France I think, and he he does like isometric and perspective dungeons and uh, buildings, a lot of kind of taverns and things like that, and they are gorgeous. And he not only does he color them in. But he, uh, they're painted with lighting, so you can see, you know, like if there's a torch, a torch here, you know, whatever, you'll see, you know, all the sides of this this building would be lit up nicely orange and a beautiful fall off of its lighting. It it's just so amazing what a sense of the space it gives you. Um, so that is Guillaume. I'll just type it here. A smaller font than that. You know what? I'll put it in the chat. That makes way more sense. Guillaume Tavernier. He's uh he posts a lot on Google Plus and he had a he had a it wasn't Kickstarter but it was a crowdsourcing thing he did a little while ago and I think I I let it go by without getting my act together and buying it because it. Uh, it's like a regional supplement and he was painting all these kind of zoomed out views of the of the regions but then zooming in to show you individual buildings if you can get in on that if you want beautifully painted isometric stuff you can probably
probably find your way into a copy. And let's have a round window. All right, one house on piling. So I don't know, what do you think? Are we, how's the estimate looking? So it's an hour and five, so in 20 minutes, we've come in a little bit. I think I'm maybe half done, so I think maybe it is 40 minutes per one-eighth of this drawing. And I haven't done uh, any of this texturing yet. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. Are you looking at his stuff now? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Guillaume is like just out of this world. Another uh, just standout um, artist you could have a look at is uh, Randy M. I don't know what his last name is, but he he does all these kind of beautiful seaside rocks with all these like fine line textures and these dungeons that go on forever like you get a strip of paper with his dungeon printed on it they're really beautiful It's a low door. A little bit cramped. It's okay. I think to a certain extent, this can be illustrative rather than specific. I think this isn't the sort of map where your players are going to be asking you, well, how many windows does that cottage have? And then you're squinting at the illustration and frustration because it doesn't show you the west wall. And so you just don't know. So I think it doesn't matter. As long as it looks like a cottage and conveys the impression to the DM. Should we have a look zoomed out? That's where we are. That did occur to me as a Kickstarter stretch goal would be to like paint all the all the all the uh, lighting onto the onto the dungeons that I've done, but I think it would take take me another six years. This place, though, actually looks a little too cheerful so far. I'm wondering if we need some something horrible hanging like a gibbet somewhere, you know, like a, some stalks or something just to really get the 
idea of the, the kind of dehumanizing awfulness of the, the bargain that's been struck here. Jamie, you're asking me if this is just a hobby. Uh, yeah, it's just a hobby. Um, it's a hobby I put a lot of hours into. But I, um, I assume people who find their way here um, know this, but I, I do two-page adventures um, that I'm publishing in a book that I talked about in the earlier this video or the last one. Uh, but you can see them on my blog. But basically, the starting spot for finding out what I'm doing and all the various things I do is my website, which is trilemma.com. It's like a dilemma, but worse. And uh, there you'll see my blog, and you'll see um, the other finished maps like this, that kind of thing. All right, let's get this. That perspective on that bridge does not look good to me. Let's do a boat. Where can you get the book? Uh, yeah, so it's not going to be out for a little bit. Um, but uh, I intend to kickstart it later this year. So if you want to, there's, there's a few places, I should really write this out, but there's a few places you can go if you want to keep up to date. One, you can just read my blog because I'll definitely post it there. Um, if you don't do that, you could follow me on Twitter. I'm Fuseboy on Twitter. Um, if you don't have Twitter um, and you just want to get regular emails, you could go to patreon.com slash adventures. Um, and every time I do an adventure, uh, I publish it there. And that's at least one way to get a notification. I also put them on Twitter, but I talk about a bunch of other stuff on Twitter as well. So it's a little bit noisier. Yeah, so um, patreon.com slash adventures. Um, and that will, uh, you don't have to back me or anything like that. They're, everything is free and public, so you can just click uh, follow, and I think you'll get an email. You probably need a Patreon account for that. Rows of stocks pointed at the central location. That is super cool. Let's put that down. Stocks. That's worth making this island bigger for. For the debtors of the sea. to take a second just look at a sailboat simple sailboat mast what did it look like Ah. There's a lot of different designs. I guess I can just kind of make something up for this culture. All right, so what am I going to do? Let's do...
I guess this is the boom, isn't it? So we're going to go with some bunch of furled fabric on this thing. And some and some skinny lines. I guess that would be tight though, wouldn't it? That's probably what's holding the tip up. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. The internet, you don't uh, have to work nearly so hard for reference material. Unless you're searching for something that's just one of those things that's hard to search for. I remember in the 80s, there was a band, The The, and uh, you think they must be impossible to find on Google. But I did actually look that up, and it turns out that I guess Google has put in special support just to be able to find find them. Maybe there's some the, the fans at Google. This is not so precisely catted about. It feels like it's a bit tall for its size. It feels like it should be shallower in the in the water. Let's fill it with crap. These are not pleasure vehicles. Let's give it a nice outline. So yeah, if I put all its cargo on pause, so this should be something like that. There should be all sorts of vill fishing villagey kinds of things on land, like uh, barrels and all sorts of stuff. Any tips on making large worlds? Uh, you're talking about like regional maps. Um, so I do those sometimes, but I haven't got a lot of uh, stuff online about those. So um, what you might do is go look at the channel of um, Ben Milton, who does a bunch of wilderness maps, and then uh, Devin Rue. Uh, she has an amazingly... Uh, steadily developed style matured over many many maps uh, so it's so professional um, she produces she was recently featured on critical role I gather actually uh, so she does commissions and she's got a huge wait list but um, she will definitely uh, have a lot to offer in terms of uh, how to do wilderness maps um, I sometimes do wilderness maps but usually I, I use um, a slightly more atlas style so it will look typically look like um, it might in a it's like a painted color drawing rather than 
that was a bad line. Or uh, then a line art version. So go go find some experts. Outline that mast in white a little bit, just to... Bring that out a bit. And I guess if I do that, maybe I should do the inner. I was going to do around this chimney, wasn't I? scooting my butt too far to the left and going out of my frame here. So a lot of little skills to this I never really thought about. Okay, what does it look like? There we go. All that work and we've got only that far. <laughs> Many say it is better to start out small if you want to create a world and branch out, but it depends on what your goal is. Yeah, I mean, if you're just trying to, like, tell the story of some, here's the world and everything that happened to it, I guess you can start out and, and uh, you know, zoom into areas as you care about them. But, uh, yeah, if you're doing it for a role-playing game, it's probably a really good idea to just start with just enough detail and... Um, one of the tips I've heard is to have rumors of a faraway place, like you have, you know, nearby places, far away play, a couple of faraway places that people can talk about, um, to kind of give the sense that the world is bigger. But by and large, don't get caught up in like trying to map the history of how the various, you know, uh, cultures of your world arrived where they are now. Otherwise, you'll just never, uh, you'll never finish. Unless you go full on, uh, is it Jerry's map? Okay, the perspective on that is so bad, I can't even decide where it should be. Oh, those are stairs, just good enough. For me, for this scale, get those X ropes again. I didn't do that here. I 
the texture. See you, Jamie. All right, we're getting there. We've made it to the second island. I'm gonna do a bit of coast just to say that we have. There we go. We've reached land. So let's finish that off like that. Thanks, Carl. I'll see you around. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to have the appetite to watch me paint this entire thing. That would just be bananas, but or draw. Okay, hey, what's important to do next? What's fun and important to do next? Um, we said piles of stuff. There should be stuff on the island. Bags. Let's put that here. Barrel, cask, that's a pretty big barrel. Let's put a couple of those. I think of my own carpentry skills and the wonky shape of this barrel. I'm trying to imagine myself making a barrel which would actually be uh, watertight doesn't happen even in my imagination. Okay. Okay, I think I'm going to do some dungeon crumbs now. It could be some coarse grasses. <laughs> the more I draw the cozier it looks, those stalks are going to be really important. That's so funny. Welcome to Death Island. Would you like tea? some crap. 
crumbs down here is the darken up a bit. It's really just to give a sense that it's not just a white zone, um, but it has some some detail to it. it doesn't really matter. I'm not going to draw individual grass or pebbles, just some texturing. All right. Oh, I miscounted. We had already made it to the second island. The first island's really, really tiny. Would you look at that? All right, let's start in on Creepy Island. I'm going to go back to sketching and figure out <clears throat> figure out what I want to do for the stocks. making the island wider. I like that idea so much, but we need more. I'm not sure how, if I can make stocks read properly at this size. Maybe I can. Um, so it would be a platform. Maybe there'd be three platforms. Might have little legs on the far side because the ground is lower there. Some thickness to them. And then the stock is like, stands like that with holes in them. Print size, uh, you can still tell probably. All right, let's do some stocks. Stock art. These are tricky little things. Let's see if you can still read it once I put this outline. I think so. All right, so I'm I didn't fill these in all the way to the ground. I figured um, the stocks would not do that. And 
I guess the key thing is really that you can understand one of them, and then you'll know what the other two are. All right, three stocks. Do we have any human sacrifices? Let me see what we have in stock. Legs. Some shadow, and then we need some wood texture. There we go, stocks. It's kind of ominous the people rolling up into this lagoon would uh, maybe see these first. All righty. And we'll do the last one, and then I think we'll call it for now. Arm is done drawing for a little bit. All right, there we go. Look at that. Well, it's coming along. i got to start thinking of some names. Andrew! Hey, Andrew. I don't know if you can hear me. My buddy Andrew has just logged in. I was just about to sign off. How's Sunday treating you? Actually, is it even Sunday for you? I think it's probably Monday. You're in the advanced part of the world. So this, uh, I was talking about this before you got on. This is the, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going to hang out a little longer since you're here, but.
but I do need to wind up before too long. My arm falls off. My arm. Actually, let's have that come up. A big wadge of wood to support that. Yeah, it is Monday. Yeah, okay, so Andrew joins us from Oceania. Whoa, I'm hitting every line I drew there. Let's try and decide how I want to texture this. I want to make it look different than all the other docks that I've made. So I think I might use dungeon flagstones for this one. Okay, there we go. Sacrificial Island started. Might as well do some house while we're here. And let's make these ones skulls. I don't know if anybody will be able to tell that's a skull from... Uh, that print size, but whatever. and draw those two parts of the roof the same. <clears throat> Microsoft Visual Studio 2017 has stopped responding. It's definitely a Monday, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think that could actually be any day of the week. Just not Sunday. All right. But, uh, let's leave no doorway here. Something colder and less inviting about there just not even being a door. Like an outdoor butcher's.
is a door on this side. I don't know. This is dark. There's a little scribble on it. Stairs. These are kind of low, flat stairs. Seem to have made some kind of stone awning here or something. The bony shield on there. Some roof tiles. This is a nice sturdy building, so let's do those corner bricks like the others have. Okay, and I guess we've almost reached the boat from here. If I just put in this piling, I said I was going to stop, and here I am, still drawing. But I think I'll finish that other end when I get to the boat. What I really want to do is outline this to make it clear where the depth is. All right, and I guess the roof juts out enough. It should probably have a little bit of outline of its own. And let's get that outlined. Whoa! crash into my own green screen. Good. All right. Well, Andrew and whoever else is watching, thank you. I'm heading out now, and uh, I'll finish this up. I don't know when I'm going to finish it online or not, but uh, uh, I will post it on Twitter if I do. Anyway, see you all.